No. Hey, hey guys. guys! Oh, we said that in unison. <laughs> we're gonna uh, talk a little bit of song talk again, but we're gonna probably hold up a little bit until a couple people get on, um, see what's going out. But it's gonna be kind of fun. I don't know who's out there yet, but it'll give us an opportunity to wait about a minute or two, and I don't know, take another half hour and talk a little bit of. Um, Kind of what goes on in the salon today, and I, um, I think it's important because you know Danielle and I had that whole Facebook live. Well, I'm almost off now. Coffee. Uh, we had that whole Facebook live uh, what a month ago, Dean, when we were kind of really talking about um, things in a salon and how to approach different avenues between the customer's view or guests that enter into our salons and the stylist's opinion on certain things. I think we covered topics like you know when a client is late versus a stylist being late. Yeah. Um, things like when a client brings their children into a salon, how do you handle that? What is appropriate? What is the appropriate way to do that? And I think that was probably a really, really good topic that we had last week. Um, also, the expectation when clients bring what we call support teams with them to get their hair done. Usually it's a friend, the mother, the sister, the brother, grandmother. You know, we just about anybody here, Exactly. Right? <laughs> um, but I think um, what we're going to kind of touch base with today, and please, if you guys have any input on it, you know, drop us a little text. What we just realized today, we, we keep talking about all these Facebook lives that we're doing, is, you know, how do we approach the largest venue of people that we can reach? And we are trying to um, reach out to clients and guests that enter into your salons, as well as reach out to um, hairdressers out there. And, um, you know, we're going back and forth, does a Facebook need to be, or somebody's page needs to be left open, is it closed, do we do it on my page, um, you know, how does it go mainstream? And I think what we're, we're going to start to do, and we're tweaking it each time we do it, is really get a handle or grip on it, maybe do it from the Salon G Facebook page. Yep. And then depending on the time frame of it, post them up onto YouTube. Yeah. You reach yeah. Afterwards. Just to try and get as many people as possible. Try and talk to as many people as possible. I think even when we do our subjects, we try to cater to the stylist, like Gerard said, as well as the client. We're trying to make it as interesting as possible for as many people as possible. I like well the coffee feel. Yeah, I do too. At first uh, I thought you were a little crazy for that, but... But it makes it look like we're really communicating. <laughs> we sort do. of arguing. <laughs> do you argue with your husband like you argue with me? Kevin, does she argue with you as much as she argues with me? That's what I like to uh, know. Yeah. But anyway. Um, so, Daniel and I talked about it, and we were trying to figure out what, what would be a good topic you know, what's really, really um, important to talk about, what makes sense to you guys, and what would you guys want, want to know. And I think that um, a really strong topic is the simple fact of, um, you know, vocabulary. And what I mean by that is a client's vocabulary or a guest that enters into your salon, their vocabulary is always different than a stylist's vocabulary. Absolutely, and I think that the way that they understand things is different than the way we understand it as well, based on the background backing knowledge that we have previous to having the conversation compared to what their previous knowledge is before they actually enter the salon. And not only that, but the explanation. You know, what is um, what does the client see? What is their expectation? What is their definition of something? And I think that, you know, a couple of things that pop off the top of my head is um, balayage. You know, I think that there's such a lack of understanding and communication in the hair industry among stylists, what balayage really is um, versus what the client thinks balayage is. They think it's actually a color. Yeah. Yeah, they think it's... I, I'm, not, I'm not always sure exactly what they think <laughs> it is, um, but I think you're right in that avenue drawer that they do think it's a color or a specific color or a specific look. Right. Um, depending on what client it is, it comes off a little bit different each time. Um, but I think, you know, just like anything, if the communication is not clear on something, you're definitely not going to get where you want to go. So, majorly important to be able to break that down and understand each other. But I think what's
what's going to be good about this topic, you know, Danielle, for us to talk about with everybody out there is, you know, for those of you guys who are guests at Enter the Salon, and those of you guys who are stylists that are actually performing the service, I think what's really, really important is um, the key topic of this whole Facebook Live is communication. And when we break that down, we're going to break that down into consultation, communication, um, the balayage communication, what does the stylist think it is, and what is the... Um, Guest think it is, um, texturing services like straightening services versus a keratin, you know, is the expectation that is given to the guest really the expectation that they came in with? Yeah. And I think that if we can focus on just those three topics, then we can really, really show when we talk about that most Hopefully important. Hopefully, we'll bring some clarification. Some enlightenment, make things easier for everybody. And I think, and I think too, Danielle, you know, it's, it's good for us to, to kind of, listen guys, we're not, you know, the, the all and the it on everything. You know what, I think that we are seasoned in, in our profession, in our industry, and we just want to share light um, to other hairdressers as well as to the um, guests that enter into your salon on a daily basis. And hopefully the, that will strengthen the relationship that you guys have with your stylist or your guests. You know, and I think that it goes hand in hand. You know, Facebook Live is a very large media of um, people that you approach, so it's not a closed-minded, like, this is a stylist session or this is a guest session. Yeah. It's a uniformity of, of creating both of them together. So, um, balayage, getting back to the whole balayage, you know, Danielle, you and I take opportunities to to go outside of what we educate as educators, you know, being the artistic director for Rusk, I'm able to travel around the world, you being a master designer with um, Rusk as well, and, and a very strong educator, very strong on color knowledge, allows you to travel out there. But we, as educators, also educate ourselves. You know, you and I went to, believe it or not, you know, we're going to say we went to the Red Clinic Exchange, yeah. which um, is any of you guys, whether you utilize Redkin or not, have an opportunity. Um, amazing. 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 Amazing exchange. Um, you know, I'm very one for giving credit where credit is due to educators that are out there. Um, young man by the name of Sean, educator over at the exchange, did a clarification on balayage to a room full of stylists. And I think it was an aha moment, as we can say. It was an enlightening. And um, I applaud him on that because, you know, here's a funny little story really, really quick. Danielle, myself, and uh, some other colleagues of ours went to an event. We were invited, very fortunate to be able to go to an exchange in New York City uh, to do something. And we were sitting at a bar before going, wrong thing to do, stylist. Don't go to a bar before you go to an education event. But we went to a bar and we had a drink and we were talking amongst ourselves and we were defining, um, not knowing what the educational event was going to be about, but we were defining balayage and what the we truth We got into a, a conversation with other people about it that are also stylists that are not in our salon that we were talking to about balayage. And long and behold, we enter into this exchange and what was the conversation about, but it was about balayage. And I think that's a really, really strong topic. You know, and I have a question for all you Facebook viewers out there. What does your client or your guest think that balayage is? So if you have a moment and you want to just shoot that over, give us, give us an idea of what your client thinks about it and your guest thinks about it. And then the other question I have is, it's a two-part question. What do you think it is? And what do fellow stylists in your own salon think it is? I know one day we were thinking about it in our own salon and everybody had a different, different definition. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, your definition of a balayage will depend on how seasoned you are as a stylist. You know, and I, and I say that politely, what I mean is how long you've been in the industry as a stylist will define what balayage really is to you. And, you know, Danielle says it, says it best, you know, we challenge you and any one of you to look up what balayage is. And balayage, truthfully, Danielle, is just... Hand paint. Hand painting. Hand painting. Just hand painting color, lighter into the hair. And it was basically doing it without foils, without plastic saran wrap, no without anything, nothing. I think originally it was, 
Right? Originally when you... Well, don't look at me without around back then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a colleague of mine who I love to death, Colleen Hennessy. And if she's watching this, you know, she, to me, is the queen of balayage because I remember helping her in putting together a handbook for beauty schools. And there was a portion that she thought was important that we needed to be in, and it was balayage. And guys, really, clients, guests, hairstylists, um, students in beauty school, if you guys are all watching this, balayage simply meant it was a technique that allowed you to apply a lightener or a color into hair by hand painting it. Just more freely, nothing contained, very loose. It's, I, I don't know if you've experienced this, Gerard, but I think, you know, an example of what I see very commonly with um, guests that are coming into the salon is they look at balayage almost like it's an ombre. Is that how we say it? Balayage. Balayage. <laughs> it becomes a tongue twister when you say it enough. Um, they look at it like it's an ombre. Like it's that color that's on the bottom part of the hair. Right. Not as hand painted. You know, it can be all the way to the new growth area. It can be in the front. It can be in the back. It can be on the sides. It doesn't really matter where it is. It's just strategically placed hand painted pieces throughout the hair. Whether that be with lightener or color, it doesn't really matter, but it doesn't have to just be only on the bottom. And I think that very commonly that is where people think that that's the vision of what they see when they think of Ilya. But I think too, you know, and we have to give credit where credit is due to the stylists out there, you know, the um, confusing uh, ness of what balayage or how the definition of balayage or how it was explained or how it was um, defined to them, and you know, other than it just being strictly hand painting to the hair, I think as time progressed and depending on what time of your career you got involved with balayage, you know, and if you put a room full of stylists together, depending on how seasoned certain stylists were, they would give a totally different definition. And like you said, you know, uh, a regular balayage started becoming an ombre, and then it started becoming, you know, a uh, ombre that was foiled and you know and then it became ombre that was foiled but then put a plastic cap on top of it and you know and they created something differently you know do we back home it and then paint it no that was just another way to create a diffused look just a different approach of color and it was a different approach but if you really really think about what balayage is and and that's why i really really have to commend um this educator, Sean, from um, Redken, um, he actually was at the BTC, if any of you guys did not ever have a chance to go to the Behind the Chair. Um, Behind the Chair puts an awesome color event on every year. I would recommend everybody to purchase a ticket and go to that this year, and that's for you stylists out there. But um, he was also there demonstrating it again, and you know, he you know, definitely does a beautiful, beautiful approach to painting light onto hair. Hey, one of our old co-workers, I have to honestly say, I kind of follow him on Facebook all the time. Um, Brandon. Brandon Rice. <laughs> yeah. Brandon Rice yeah. does a beautiful got beautiful to be one of the yeah. neatest people about Balayage and does beautiful work. So look that name up, guys. Brandon Rice, you should follow him on Facebook, um, as well as, of course, myself and Danielle. Yeah. But he's another one that does some beautiful, beautiful work out there on Instagram and on Facebook. So I think, you know, understanding what balayage is. Now let's talk a minute, we talked about it for the size point of view, let's kind of relate to the clients that are out there, the guests that enter into the salons, because I think they're totally lost. They really don't understand what balayage is. Well, you can't blame them in a, in a certain, you know, way or aspect, you know, the, when celebrities started to do it, I think that when they saw it on celebrities, it was more of a sun-kissed look. And, it and that's was, what Balayage originally was. Yes. Just to create a sun-kissed look yes, there. It wasn't somebody who had um, a very dark color hair and extremely white or light highlighting effect. It was more of a natural sun-kissed look. So I think because of that, that's where the whole ombre idea of Balayage came in for um, guests for the everyday person. That's where they got it from. They saw celebrities doing it. And when they saw it on a celebrity, it was a picture in a magazine of them with lighter pieces more towards the bottom, and it said that it was bioyage. Which, 
by the way, I may add, is disillusion because let's face the fact, you know, whenever you look at um, beautiful images that are in beautiful magazines, whether they're industry magazines or they are, um, you know, what I consider magazines in the public, like, you know, Cosmopolitan, Vogue, In Glamour, Style, right. yeah, Glamour, all mm -hmm. those magazines, you, you have to realize, though, too, and I do say this, you know, with all due respect to every editorial person that does work out there, including myself, you know, that does do editorial work. You know, you've been on photo shoots as well, so you kind of understand that whole meaning. Um, there's lighting involved, there's touch-up involved, there's, you know, alteration. There's a until I take the picture. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's a lot of that involved. It's only meant as an inspiration, not meant as an actuality. And I think that's really, really important. Listen, I'm the one that's going to call it for what it's worth, and I probably am going to be, you know, one of those people that curse on TV and everybody tries to bleep out. But let's call it for what it's really, really worth. You know what, if you're going to tell me that every photograph that you see in a magazine that's done by anybody that does editorial work has not somehow, some way, in some shape or form, been tweaked a little bit, I call you guys out on that. Sorry, and I hope I did not offend anybody, which I probably did. <laughs> I have a habit of doing that. But you know what? I'm going to call a spade a spade. And I think that that's really, really important to, to view that. And that's why sometimes it is. You know, sometimes it is very achievable, and sometimes it is not achievable to recreate some of the colors that you see. You know, let me tell you guys something. Um, I love the Latino guests that come into my salon. Love them. And I love my Filipino and my Asian guests that walk into my salon. But when you come in with a natural level two, which is very, very rare. dark, almost black. Okay. <laughs> and you expect to be platinum blonde with a silver cast by body washing. It ain't going to happen if you want to take that hair home on your head. <laughs> Um, and let's be realistic about that. You know, anything is achievable within time, and anything is achievable providing you want to spend that time and pay that bill at the end of the day. And we have to be reasonable. You know, it's just like we talk about these beautiful shades of color, these pops of color that have placed in somebody's hair. How do you take somebody and make them a unicorn or the galaxy colors that I did on Facebook not too long ago? Um, or how do you do the mermaid colors? You know how you do it, especially when you're level two? You pre-lighten the hair until you're platinum blonde, weave it at the base, and then we apply those beautiful pastel colors. And you know what? At the end of the day, you're six to nine hours in the salon and four hundred and fifty to six hundred dollars in a bill. On a low end. Yeah. On a, yeah. On a low and you know what? That's being realistic because mm -hmm. let's you can't expect a stylist to take one client a day, produce that type of work without getting the reward and the ratification at the end of it. And that all come to it. So how do we approach these looks? How do we do them at a much more affordable pricing and much more sensible time frame for both the stylists and the guests? Yeah, and I think, I think definitely a way that we approach that, and I'll tell you even when I work with some of my guests that come in, you know, I say we can do a little bit at a time. We can do a little bit at a time. Let's not do, you know, a full head of balayage. Let's balayage a few pieces in while we do your new growth at the same time. Let's balayage. I had somebody recently. I put a few foils on the top, and I know that she'll probably want to add a pink or a rose gold or something to that maybe on her next visit, but she doesn't mind if the highlight's not all the way to the new growth. So we kind of do it one step at a time. Pre-lighten first, next visit we can throw some color on it, the next visit maybe we'll change the color. Different uh, different strokes for different folks basically, depending on the budget and the taste. You know, being able to communicate and understand each other and work through that depending on whatever the situation and the desired result is. But I think it's also important to realize too guys, you know, um, one thing that takes a, a, a toll into that is pricing. And you know what? You can't expect somebody in New York City to have the same pricing as somebody in Wichita, Kansas, or Omaha, Nebraska, or you know North Carolina versus Florida. I mean, 
you know, there's a lot that takes in into play with that. So, you know, it, things need to be priced accordingly. So those of you who are stylists out there, no. By all means, I don't agree to the fact that if, you know, Joe Schmo is getting, you know, $150 for a single application, and that is a set price geographically located across the board. Because it is not. Um, it is, it's not feasible. It's not feasible to the client that interests or the guest that interests in your slime. It's not um, feasible for the stylist that's doing the work, nor the other way around. Should somebody, you know, be charging $15 for a single process call? I mean, it's, you know, what's the old saying? You pay for what you get. And you pay yeah, what you pay for. <laughs> yeah. You know, so let's, let's be realistic about it. Your time is valuable, you know, and you need to be aware. And at the end of the day, there should be no rush job with any guest that enter into your salon. They should be, you know. Yeah, I, I like it when they, we talked about this and we, we heard it at the BCC thing, you know, um, some salons do online booking. You know, is that feasible to a salon that does a lot of color? You know, our salon is Salon G here at Color Spa. You know, and that's what our focus is. It's a lot of color. We do a lot of color. Um, I haven't released online booking for the salon yet because of the color services that we do in it because you know what? You'll always get that client that'll book or that guest that doesn't understand the booking process. She's a first time client. She heard about you, read about you in the salon. She goes to book online. Wow, Danielle's got a four o'clock opening. You know, salon closes at six. They book at four o'clock, but this is what they forgot to tell you. They forgot to tell you. Mm -hmm. I'm a natural level two, and you notice that when they walk through the door, Oh, and by the way, I need to be platinum blonde by the evening. So I think it's, you know. Yeah. It's, it's and you can't, you can't really, I mean, you can't blame them, you know. I have clients, and I, I know you have clients like this as well, George. I have people that call my receptionist here. They'll call a receptionist and say, uh, Sarah will say, you know, what are you coming in for? And they say, I don't know, you have to ask Danielle, or I don't know, you have to ask Gerard, right? Because they leave their hair in our hands when they build up enough trust, and they truly don't even know. They'll come in, how was your color last time? Oh, it was great. Are we doing highlights this time? I don't know, tell me what you think, right? So it, it's not even a matter of they don't even, if they don't know, if it's highlights, color, whatever. They trust our professional opinion. And they should. Yeah. And, and so they should. You know, when you think about that, you are their physician when it comes to their hair. You are the one that should be doing the suggestion, and you are the one that's going to be telling them what, you know, here's the fact, here's an underlying pigment in this color, this is what we can do, this is what we cannot do, but this is where I can bring you in time. You know, I don't know about these days where you walk into a salon and you go from, you know, we always used to say this as a, as a tagline, change your mind, change your color, and that is acceptable, and that is correct. But does that mean that that's going to change in an hour time? Well, everything is dependent. It's depending on what walks into your salon. Listen, we do education, we do shows, we do photo shoots. You know what, we have the time frame that allows us. And here's the other thing. We pick and choose what model we choose to do it on. So I think that's important. We know where we're starting. Exactly. Yeah. So that, that's our whole kind of spiel on, on you know, what, de what defines a balayage. So just to recap that really quickly, you know, it's balayage definition, the true meaning of balayage, is just hand painting. And just to create, you know, a shimmer to the hair, a um, sun-kissed sun highlight to the hair. Not to take somebody from a level one to a level nine, from um, scalp to ends, and expect that to be, or not to define it as a ombre or a sombre. Or a combre, or whatever you want to call it. Do you have to back comb it? No. Can you paint it? It's a free standard balayage. Free standard painting into the hair. That's all it is. Take that and allow your creative juices to flow. To create a look, a color, a blending, a melting, whatever you choose to create. So, here's my favorite, Danielle. You know, um, one of mine is, because we, we tend to branch out and we do a lot of it, you know, we have to use a product called Magic Sleep. But what is the true definition of a keratin versus a relaxer versus a straightening system? You know, that's a very, very big array, and it's definitely. I had somebody actually today come in, my first client of the day, new client. She called today. We have availability, so she came in, 
and we were talking, and the first thing she said to me, I talked to her a little bit about her color, and she said, you know, I really like the way you explain color to me. It makes me understand. Nobody's ever done that. And I wanted to know what your thoughts were on keratin, because I get keratin treatments quite regularly. I used to get them when they had formaldehyde in them, and now it's slightly different. I feel like the result is not the same. So we started to discuss this a little bit further. Sorry, guys. I know what I'm on to because uh, Brian, you are so welcome. I think it was Brian. Uh, Brian had said something about thanks for telling the truth. Um, so I have to look at it because it's in my notes. But I think the truth. I think the truth is 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 really really important. Um, you know, I hope I got the right person that said thank you for telling the truth. Um, I believe it was Brian. Brian Fry. Yeah. So here's my thing, Brian. You know, when you're truthful about something and you're straightforward, it tends to either get you in trouble or it gets you to create a following. Hopefully in our case it gets following. But here's what I realized. Telling the truth, if you think about it, I think the only shows or the only people that tell the truth are the people on the Housewives of New Jersey, the Housewives of New York, the Housewives of Hollywood, the ones that fight all the time. And here's the thing, Brian, we're telling you the truth and all we're drinking is coffee. Okay, we don't even have alcohol. So, so you, you're welcome uh, for talking to you. But I won't look at that. Well, I'm going to look at that so I can kind of ask questions. Nas is up there. What's up, Nas? Hey, those of you guys, Nas Capelli, you need to follow him. You need to check his work out. Um, we're going we're gonna to touch a little bit at the end of this um, Facebook Live, a little bit about education for the stylist. But let's get back to what we were talking about, about keratin. That's another one of my pet peeves. Let's be honest about keratin. Okay, let's, let's be honest. Let's stop telling people that it's going to give them straight hair. Yes. Because <laughs> it's not going to happen, guys. So, you know, just to touch on that a little bit, I was explaining to my client this morning, like I said before, you know, curly hair has certain bonds that make the hair curly, and straight hair has certain bonds that make the hair straight. Keratin does not alter those bonds in any way, shape, or form. The best explanation that I have ever heard of a keratin or word that was associated with the keratin was deflation or deflate. Amen. Amen. To deflate the hair. Pop the balloon. <laughs> we can't deflate that anymore. Right. No. <laughs> no, but you know what? Here's the funny thing. You know, um, Danielle, my good friend Nas, all of them always get into my hair. Nas has been always after me. Nas um, works with... Um, a service, a product, you know, um, I believe, and I might be saying this wrong, um, I know that Nas works with Magic Sleek, I work with Magic Sleek, Danielle works with Magic Sleek, we also have worked with um, Coppola, Coppola is another one, Rejuvenol is another one out there, um, Anti-Curl was real popular for a long period of time, you know, everybody has their favorite and we switch on, you get bored of it, you find something a little bit better. Um, does it make the hair perfectly straight? No, stop telling your clients that. Because every client or guest that walks in the door to your salon that said, you know what? And that's another thing too. You know, everybody's advertising, a straightening, a smoothing. It, it's a defrism. It's kind of a value for the hair. It's a place that makes it smoother. Most importantly, it makes it easier for the client to blow dry their hair at home. You know, and we're at it. Who wants to focus your hair before? If you wanted that, you should have had Japanese parents. <laughs> I don't want to go with you. No, I want to No, I mean that's, I mean, yeah. that's an insult. Yeah. You know what? I want to look like some of those models and take my shirt off 24-7. If I had those bodies, I'd work behind my chair with no shirt on. All day long. But you know what? Thank Real God. <laughs> <laughs> reality, I love this thing. Reality <laughs> is reality. All right? You know, we, we, you have to be honest. Yeah. You know, you got to be honest and all at, at the end of the day, you have to remember this. You, you may, okay, so for example, I'm just going to throw this out here. We charge three fifty dollars for a character treatment, right? So if that client today who came in, now she's been to several different salons. I could tell from talking to her a little bit of what's going on in her hair. And that's fine. You can tell she jumped around a little bit. Maybe she hasn't found her happy place. Um... And maybe that's what she was looking for, but 
That being said, if I said to her, yeah, okay, you can do your keratin, let's do it today with your color, and I would have sold it to her, and I would have made that $350 today plus the color, right? But at the end of the day, in another week or two, she would have noticed her hair wasn't perfectly straight, and I would have made her unhappy, and I would have fell into that category of places I have already been that have already not done what they said they were going to do. So I don't want to fall in that category. I want to be honest. I want to tell her the truth about her color. I want to tell her the truth about keratin. I want to speak knowledgeably and confidently about whatever I'm using on her to create that bond between stylist and guest so that she wants to come back. So instead of making that 350 plus whatever I charge her for color today, I'm going to have her as a continuing client because she's going to want to consistently come back. But I think what's important too, what, what you did today and what, what stylists need to do, and, and here's the other side of this, on the flip side of this, as a consumer, as a guest that enters into all these salons across North America, you actually were doing a service, providing color and highlights today on somebody, as well as consulting them in a future service. And the client was asking because she was interested. So. Look at it this way, you are, you are servicing two ends of this. You are servicing your future sales and your future business in the salon. You're providing a service that a client has a need for. Now, if somebody came in and their hair didn't require it, what is the point of offering? Do you know what I mean? I refuse many of clients of a couple of services. I'll give you a prime example. You know, when texture was becoming really, really big and, and curly hair slowly on the rise again, wavier hair, yep. um, the client that came in with, I think she must have had a triple process, not even a double process of hair, but when I tell you it was beyond blonde because there was no color pigment left in that hair and wanted to perm it, I'm like, you, and my exact words are, you've got to be kidding me. You've got to be kidding me. You have more texture. I can't even cut you. You have so much texture. So you've got to stimulate your client's knowledge of what actually is going to happen. Or you need to have a lot of release forms in your place of business because, you know, you can provide whatever you want to provide for the client, but the whole idea is when the client walks into the salon and your guests come into your chairs with hair on their head, they need to leave with that hair on their head, just slightly different. Maybe a different color, maybe a different style. Some of it is left on the floor because you cut it, not because it fell off. Burnt off. You know, so I think that, you know, what you did was by servicing your client today was probably an ideal situation because you created a service, your client was happy. It was a new client, by the way, who kept saying the whole time that she was here, I should have been here for my son's wedding. She came in for my son's wedding, left with a future service to come back to. So I think that's important. I think, yeah, absolutely. And keeping, you know, you always want to give your clients what they want. But at the same time, you have to be reasonable. And you always, I always say, integrity of the hair. I, 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 I'm going to tell you in a second because I know you're going to have a hard time saying that. Um, at the same time, you want to give them what they want, but you want to keep the integrity of the hair. What I want to bring up right now. Wait, is, what do you mean I'm going to have a hard time seeing that? Tell me why. Yes, you need your new glasses. No, it was um, Devin who asked, yes. what best advice, what's the best advice you have for a new stylist? Well, let me ask you some Devin. Um, Devin, sorry. Um, advice for what, though? How to approach a situation like that? In or, general. In general, like, you know, um, I'll give you a couple of advices that I have for a new stylist is to never have the helium blow your head up bigger than you can handle. And what I mean by that is that, you know, I'm a seasoned stylist, I've been in the industry, I've owned and operated Salon G for over um, 27 years now. Um, I've been in the industry for, oh, um, I lied, 26 years. I've been in the industry for 27 years. Um, but I, I don't forget where I came from. Number one, I love so much what I do that we share this. I think Danielle, and Danielle is just as seasoned as I. She's just a little prettier than I am. But um, we continuously go to outside education. Don't stop. Don't stop. When you stop learning, you stop growing. Exactly. 
Always keep your feet damp. Um, and I'm going to mention, you know, I mentioned a little bit of how we went to the Reckon Exchange. I have to share, I have to um, give kudos to something. Um, check out the Sheer Police website. There is ongoing education with them all the time. There's, um, I believe there's some education coming up with Sheer Police in um, Hickory, North Carolina. I know that might be far to some people. But from my understanding, there will be future education coming to the New York area, the Boston area, the New Jersey area. So check out Cheer Police. They got some great education. You guys should check it out. So keep that, Devin, keep that education going on and keep looking for education wherever you can find it. Uh, so let's kind of just retouch um, keratins versus straightenings versus relaxers. Um, understand the difference between them all. And don't shy away from it because you know what? Your clients that, that get a relaxer are not the client that is looking for a smoothing surface. Yeah, they're not looking to deflate the hair. They're looking to straighten that hair. They want to see straighter hair. They want to see those curls kind of loosen up and disappear a little bit. You know, in reality, nobody's going to sleep and waking up like a Victoria's Secret model every day. You know, so that's something we start to <laughs> It does, but it's the truth, right? So you have to keep that in mind. I think that's really important. Understand what each service does. Don't just, you know, I think because we're visual people sometimes, even from a stylist perspective, uh, we see a poster, right? Any keratin company, we see a poster. What do we see? One side we see a girl with crazy curly, frizzy hair, and on the other side of the poster, we see a girl with beautiful, flat, shiny, straight hair. So immediately, if we don't look into it any further, we say, oh, we need that product, right? But we don't really understand that product, and that sometimes causes us to give our guests um, or the average consumer, even that company sometimes can give the consumer a general idea that that's what that's going to do, right? We're going to go from crazy curly to super straight, and that's how we're going to wake up every day. We need to be very clear on how we portray each service that we're going to provide. Break it down for them, understand it individually as stylists. This way we can communicate properly to the guests. What are you trying to read? Well, I'm reading Devin because he's got a <laughs> question. Okay, so Devin, you're on. Uh, can you see? Well, of course I can see. Um, in, I can see it better this part. <laughs> in general, uh, he has many goals with the industry um, to accomplish. Sometimes as a new size, it's kind of hard to pick where and how to begin. Okay, it's, that's understandable. Well, it is understandable, but I think, Devin, you have to, um, you know, you have to realize what are your true goals, okay? You know, you're never going to accomplish everything, okay? And here's the thing. Um, it's very easy. This is something that we learned today. It's very easy to say I'm good at something. But good is usually the enemy of great. There are greater things that are set before you. And when you just set up for being good, you know, I used to, as a child, I used to have this little saying that a teacher taught me, good, better, best, and never let it rest until your good gets better and your better gets it's best. best. Yeah. And I mean, I know that one too. It was like, I thought I was the only one that was wow. talking about it. But um, I used to say to my good friend Jim Roberts, used to laugh when I used to say that. But you know what, Debbie? You know, you have so many things you want to accomplish, and it's understandable, you know, and I think that, you know, as we started out, there's so many things that we wanted to accomplish. But find out what your niche is. You know, whenever I educate stylists, I tell them two things. Every stylist that's watching this um, Facebook right now, you're either a technical stylist or you're a creative stylist. One word of advice that I can share with you is that define what you are first. It allows the learning process to become so much easier. Well, then you know how to learn. Exactly. You know how you personally learn. Because if you struggle when you try to accomplish everything you accomplish, then you're not defining where you sit. Creative people see things differently. Technical people approach things differently. But the two always meet together. So I think that that's one word of advice I can give you. Define where you are. Are you creative or are you technical? One is not better than the other. Like, like Danielle said, it makes your learning process so much easier. Yeah, really and another, another little thing I can add to that is 
you know, we talk about this when we talk about managing the salon. What's up, Kevin? Kevin Kirk. Guys, another person. You need to watch Kevin Kirk. He just won Warner Brothers for the fourth time. Not once, not twice, not three, but my brother hit it four times. This man is amazing. He is talented, Mr. Kevin Kirk. I took my hat to you if I had one on. But um, I think you are awesome. You are somebody that I look up to. Um, check Facebook, guys. Follow him on Facebook and watch his Facebook lives because he gives some really, really, really good information. And what I love about Mr. Kirk is he's humble. He's willing to share everything. Great job, Kevin. Proud of you that you won. Born Brothers. Of course, you still haven't invited me to be a guest there, but we'll talk about that later on. <laughs> so I'm really glad you saw Kevin's comment. Yeah. And you got to lash that out. Okay, sorry. I was in the middle of telling Devin something. Okay, go okay. <laughs> ahead. So, you know how we discussed in the salon about how we work together as a team and you're talking about, you know, finding your strength or the way that you learn. And just like in a salon, you know, when you're operating in a salon, you have certain people that are good at certain things. And everybody has their one thing that they know that they're really great at off the bat. So I think that that's a really good place to start, Devin. You know, find your one thing that you feel you're strongest at first and make that good thing great. And then I feel like everything else kind of falls into concession and follows. There you go. Said it the same way I did, just a little differently. No, I'm just kidding. I'm like, I love this car. I love this car. So, so we kind of talked a little bit about, you know, understanding um, balayage understanding carriage and service and carriage achievement, I think I want to summarize this all up. Um, this Facebook is um, for the consumer and the stylist to understand who do you place that on? Who is the right canvas? Because let me tell you this, you know, when you think of Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci and um, Einstein, who happens to be one of my favorite up there, when you think of all these intelligent people and what they did and what they created, you know, it was created on the right canvas. It was given the right circumstance. Thought out with the right media in mind. And I think as stylists you need to look at it that way. As a consumer, you need to be taught if you are the right canvas for that color, for that service, for that cut. You know, I'm going to put my neck out there by saying this, and I'm sure that there will probably be stylists that might challenge me, um, but I truly, truly believe and I truly, truly feel that face structure is really, really important. Um, I know that I was watching Vivian McKinder um, talk about facial structures, but she did it in a different way at the BTC event, and she talked about facial structure and how to camouflage that with color placement. And I thought that, that was really, really amazing. And I learned a lot of Vivian to talking about that in that aspect. And of course that is done with the way we cut hair, where we leave hair, where we remove it from. How do we work and deflate around the face structure? But how do we fill up a much more oval face structure? But here's what I have to actually have to say. There are one, possibly two haircuts. Possibly two. But there's one haircut that looks good on every individual person that walks the face of this earth. Each and every one of us. Everything else that we do is because of fashion, trend, and style. Okay? Very true. Everything else we do. You know, I remember one day, and if Nas uh, Capellian is still watching, Nas, you remember back in the day that I wanted this certain look. And here's a true story what happened. Jim Roberts and myself were in a hotel room with a bottle of wine and a box <laughs> yeah, of anti-curl <laughs> and a box of anti-curl. Bottle of wine and a box of anti-curl, we decided that we were going to deflate my hair and smooth it out. Had it deflated, had it smoothed out, forgot the product was up to my hair, no problem, rinse it off. My hair was flat as a black could be. Sandra Yu, great colleague of mine, another great hairdresser, decided she's going to cut it. Now I was compelling and decided, let's put a few highlights in it. At the end of it, I styled it that day, I was ready to go on stage, and Nas Capellian looked at me and said, you look like an exotic bird. <laughs> and those words stuck with me 20 years into it. I still, and I don't know if Nas remembers it when he called me that exotic bird, but it was the wrong haircut 
definitely the wrong anti-girl service. He remembers. Or he remembers. Yeah, yeah. And the wrong highlights that I placed on my hair. But most importantly, it was all done with a bottle of wine taken in. So that was the wrong, the wrong moment. Distorted vision. Distorted vision. But it didn't matter because it was the style at the time. It's what I wanted. So I think it's really, really important for us as stylists to realize what is the canvas we are working on? Examine that canvas. Look at the canvas. Look at the hairline. Look at the facial structure. Look at how far the eyes set apart. If you look into the center of somebody's eyes, it's going to tell you what colors are going to look good in their hair. Look at their skin tone. That all comes into play. And I have to tell you this. When you went to State Board of Cosmetologists, those of you guys who are, are licensed, you, that's your oath. You took an oath that that's what you were going to do when you decided to create a style. Otherwise, you're just being just good. Just doing it to do it. And you're Be just great. being good. Be great. Be great at it. You're right. Good is the enemy of great. So if you eliminate good, you always strive for great. You know what? Um, another quick saying, and we'll kind of summarize it in this up. You know, are you the type of person that gives 100%? Because 100% gets you by, but 150% gets you noticed. And you always want to be that individual that wants to be noticed. I think, I think that was kind of good. We're all looking at Kevin Kirk. You are awesome, my friend. You are the one that's awesome. So let's, um, let's kind of summarize it up. Let's share a couple of little um, tidbits with you guys. Um, you know, we talked about it before. Um, our buddy Brandon Rice, beautiful guy to follow if you're looking on Facebook. Nas Capellian, dynamic stylist. He used to be the creative um, team on Ross. He's now branched out. He's doing his own thing. He's got some great education going on. Um, remember, education is the key to everything. Kevin Kirk, not one, not two, not three, but what? Four. Four time Barnum Brothers winner. The man is amazing. Follow him on Facebook, guys. Um, I hope I see you guys at another event. Check out Sheer Police. they got ongoing education. Um, and like I said, you know, I think there's two events coming up in October, my friends are telling me. Check that out. If you are in that area, or if you want to take the plunge, hey, the, North Carolina is the best place to go for education. Inexpensive to fly there. Not expensive to get a hotel room. Great education. What more could you want? But as, as a stylist, guys, continue to educate yourself. Like Danielle says, keep your feet wet because it keeps continuously growing you. And I think that's really, really important. And for the consumer out there, the guests that enter into your salon, educate yourself as well. It is our job as stylists to educate you, and I'm willing to educate you when you walk through the doors of Salon G in Hackensack. And I'm sure Danielle feels that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'm always more than willing to give my guests education and help them understand what's going on. Sometimes I feel like I give them too much information. <laughs> Just talk yourself into it and talk yourself right out of it at the same time. That is going to be our next Facebook Live. How do you talk yourself into something and then talk yourself right out of it? I think our clients do that. Sometimes they come in with a big expectation. You know, um, we end up talking them into it and then talking them out of it at the same token. So that could be our next, next Facebook Live. Let's talk about how to create and give you the license to create whatever you choose to create, but keeping it within a realm of reality. And most importantly, honest. Let's end this off by saying, remember one thing, good is the enemy of great. Don't strive to be good, strive to be great. We will see you guys the first of That's the month just looked at. in That's October. October 4th. October 4th will be our next Facebook Live. I want you guys to continuously look at Facebook, look at my page, look at Danielle's page. We will advertise that. We are going to try to enhance the presentation of everything a little bit better for you guys. Maybe we will um, mainstream it live to the salon page so that because that's open to the public so that everybody can Bear see that. Bear with our learning curves of technology. Bear with our learning <laughs> curves of technology. We, we just learned how to position ourselves so we look thinner, so let's continue <laughs> to do that. Guys, I love you guys for chiming in with us. See Thanks you guys at the next event. Guys. Chill out. Have a great weekend. Love you. And God bless you all.